Senator Dodd, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Matt. I'm delighted to be with you. Why don't we start with uh, Connecticut? That's where it started for you. Um, you know, as a as a politician who represented Connecticut, um, what's unique about Connecticut, and how did it change while you were serving it? Well, we're sort of like I often say, Connecticut's like sort of Alsace Lorraine. I mean, uh, stuck between Boston and New York. We have to export all of our sports allegiances. Uh, causes great division in the state, and depending on where you live in the state, if you're west of the Connecticut River, you're probably a Yankees and Mets fan or a Rangers fan or the uh, uh, the New York Knicks were east of the river, the Celtics, the Bruins, the Patriots. Uh, uh, so that's a, it's a state. It was sort of Connecticut was sort of the Silicon Valley of the 18th century, 19th century. Uh, Hartford, Connecticut, in many ways, the manufacturing sort of Silicon Valley with a lot of technology and inter interchangeable parts in manufacturing uh, going back a long time. Became, of course, the insurance capital uh, early on in the 20th century uh, with travelers and Aetna and Connecticut General and like over the years. Uh, had major corporations. If, if Connecticut's small, not as small as Vermont or Delaware, but small. Uh, and yet you have incredible academic institutions. Uh, the University of Connecticut, the flagship university, a whole state system, a number of community colleges. Uh, but then we also have a Trinity and a Wesley and a Yale, the Coast Guard Academy, Connecticut College, uh, Fairfield University, the list goes on for a small state, a strong, uh, 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 a strong connection with, with uh, academic institutions uh, designed in many ways to serve a very diverse uh, population, not just to the state, but elsewhere as well. Um, so that's a, it, it's, a, it, it's an affluent state. Uh, everyone always talks about how uh, affluent Connecticut is, which is true on a per capita income basis. One of the highest, if not the highest in the country, largely due to one area. Uh, but we also don't talk about as easily as that Hartford and New Haven and Waterbury are three of the, some of the poorest cities in the country uh, in the midst of of great affluence in many, many ways. It's been through a rough time uh, in many ways, um, but as lately, uh, in, in fact, timely for doing this interview, um, in the midst of the pandemic, we've had great leadership by Governor Ned Lamont, uh, who was elected um, three years ago, came in and of course, the first thing he was hit with is a uh, dreadful pandemic that has taken such a cost, both in terms of people's health and lives, as well as our economic well-being. Uh, and has done a terrific job. He did something that not enough people do. It, is, uh, he came from a, a business management background, never held any public office before. Um, and when faced with this problem, he attracted the best people he could find in the health related areas, economic areas, and relied on them to a large extent about what, how the state would conduct itself uh, during all of this. And early on, we had one of the highest rates of uh, of, uh, of uh, people getting vaccinated, uh, steps that were being taken. The state legislature gave them incredible power. Uh, did again just the other day, and the even though it seemed to be hopefully coming out of a lot of this, although the, the Delta variant is worrying everyone. Uh, so did a great job. It's really uh, improved the quality of the state tremendously. Uh, we're now uh, ranked, we used to be ranked near the bottom on a, a business environment, uh, even though we had this great previous history. But just in the last three or four years, uh, we've risen now to around 20th in the country out of 50 states and doing better every single day. Property values, I think there are five markets in the country where property values have been moving up dramatically. It's places like Austin, Texas, uh, 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 Orem, Utah. Uh, I think it was uh, Boise, Idaho is one as well. Uh, and, and, and Connecticut, Fairfield, Connecticut as well. So a lot is changing. There's a lot all of a sudden changed rather dramatically in the midst of this dark period we've been through. Kind of a long answer for you, but uh, uh, a state that um, has made had great political leadership over the The existence of the United States Senate was solely responsible because of Al, uh, Roger Sherman and Oliver Ellsworth, two members of the Continental Congress who uh, offered the Connecticut Compromise, which created the United States Senate uh, as a way to protect small states uh, and also to protect against what can be a tyranny of the majority from time to time. So uh, a long history, political history, and uh, fascinating people have come out of it over the years, both in business leadership as well as politics. So not big, uh, not large, not populated tremendously, but 
uh, played a significant role in the country. Well, let's move on to yourself then as a, as a product of, uh, of Connecticut. Um, so in terms of your career, it's been incredibly, uh, uh, you know, quite a journey for you, uh, crossing lots of different areas of the US political spectrum. Uh, can you just walk us through your own career as you see it, you know, from the beginning until where you are now? Yeah. Well, it's a uh, 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 Georgetown prep. Uh, I'll start there, I guess, I guess. Grew up in Connecticut. My father was elected to uh, uh, the Congress the House in 1952 and 54, uh, and then elected to the Senate in 1958. And so in 1959, uh, the family moved to Washington. We didn't when he was in the House. Um, but we did that he was elected to the Senate for the six year term. And so I, I started, as Jay, uh, our mutual friend may have told you, midway in my freshman year in high school at Georgetown Prep. I went to Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and when I left Providence, I joined the Peace Corps, um, which was a very exciting. I was uh, made that decision in the fall of my senior year. I was sent to the Dominican Republic on the border with Haiti, where I spent the next two years, two years plus. I traveled all through South America, came back, um, wrote for a newspaper, uh, was, uh, went through basic training in the army, went to law school, uh, and uh, came back practicing law in, in London, Connecticut. And a seat opened up in the Congress and a group of people came and asked if I'd like to take a run at it. In uh, 1974, became the Watergate year, of course, to the trials of Richard Nixon, and uh, was elected with a, one of the largest classes ever elected to the Congress in the fall of 1974, and served for six years in the House. Abe Rivikoff, a former governor, United States Senator from Connecticut, announced his retirement in 1979, and um, uh, again, uh, went through a process of making a decision whether or not to leave the House or end a career in politics, I suppose, but decided to take a run at the Senate seat, was elected in a tough year, 1980. There were only two of us elected. 16 Democrats lost their seats in 1980 across the country, and, uh, and then served the next 30 years, five different elections uh, to the Senate, retired in 2000, the end of 2010, January of 2011. And then I became the CEO and the, uh, the, uh, and the chairman of the board of the Motion Picture Association of the six largest studios, Hollywood studios, represented them for seven years, uh, domestically as well as internationally. Uh, traveled all over the, the world. We talked about our different experiences in China. I spent a lot of time in China as we more than doubled our volume. We moved into China and increased the revenue sources for the companies producing uh, the films and uh, being widely viewed in China. Uh, when I left that, I, I joined a law firm in Washington, Arnold and Porter. Um, some strong ties in Connecticut it was founded by Abe Fortas and two professors from Yale University. My father and Abe Fortas were classmates at Yale Law School, 1933. Um, and when I, uh, when I joined uh, here, Abe Ribicoff, when he left the Senate, joined uh, the firm of uh, Kay Scholler in New York. So I had much, no much choice, I guess, between my father and Abe Ribicoff, joining Arnold and Porter became sort of a natural move. I've been here about four years, enjoy it very, very much, uh, the work. And I uh, have two teenage daughters. Um, one's going off to college in a few weeks. And the other will be a junior in high school, a late bloomer in the father business, but enjoy my family immensely. And uh, we made it through the pandemic without any health issues in our immediate family. So we're in good shape and uh, hoping the country will get back on its feet again. So that's kind of a, uh, probably a long winded, I guess senators can't stop filibustering once they get talking. So I apologize. We have a question about rules later uh, yeah. that we'll get to. Um, but uh, fantastic. So why don't we talk a little bit about, you know, your time in the Senate? Um, you know, particularly I, my first question is really around which bills uh, you, you know, you decide to sponsor and why? Which what other, which, uh, you know, other legislation do you decide to, to uh, support and why? Um, you know, is it coming from constituents? Is it from, you know, uh, your personal experience? You know, I, I'd like to understand sort of the mentality of the bill creation process, since that's really the beginning of, 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 uh, of the way um, Congress works. Yeah. Well, that's a good question, Matt. I mean, uh, you know, every, it, it's a collaborative body, obviously the Senate is, and, and yet 
made up of a hundred very people very individualistic in many ways. Uh, most of them, uh, to quote a line from, I think it was Gene McCarthy who once said that the Senate ought to be a place where people of reputation come, not where you come to make a reputation. Um, and for the most part, that's true. Uh, former governors, mayors, members of the House, obviously, uh, from the business community. I mean, there are all sorts of uh, military. Um, so it, it's it's there's no there's no specific path. I think that people always wonder, what should I be doing if someday I'd like to be doing that? Uh, I think they, they, they there isn't any uh, sort of plan I can identify for you that would necessarily lead you to that result. And it's. It's a, it's a dangerous ambition to have. I think there's only been about 1,100 of us that ever served in the United States Senate after 240 years. Uh, so it's not a question necessarily, nor of how brilliant and talented and gifted you are. It's being in the right place at the right time under the right circumstances. There have been many talented, talented people who would have been great senators, in my view, members of the House or governors, where the opportunities just never came along. Things didn't line up right, unlike other things. You could aspire to be a doctor, a lawyer, and an accountant or whatever, and you can study and probably end up in those professions if you have the basic talents to do so. Uh, getting elected to public life depends on so many variables over which you have no control. Uh, you can decide when to get out of it if you're in it, but deciding whether or not to get in it is really left up to an awful lot of factors. You have little or nothing to say about. Uh, so having said that to you, the model that I chose um, early on, in fact, before, uh, after being elected is to how would I like to, how, if you're that's like casting yourself, I'll pick up, I'm on my MPAA days, the motion picture business. And the senators historically that impressed me, not because of the views they had necessarily, but how they conducted themselves as a member. And that is they, 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 they chose areas uh, that, that would make sense to them. One, so first of all, something you know something about. <laughs> uh, it's always a good place to start. Um, and secondly, uh, it's nothing wrong with then also deciding something you'd like to learn about and become uh, active in if you could. And, and thirdly, and not necessarily in this particular order, but um, your constituency, you're on a national legislature, but obviously you serve at the, at the, the will and, and the support of your state. Uh, and so to make sure there are areas in which you're paying attention uh, to their needs uh, to a larger extent in the macro sense, obviously the day-to-day -day things, but what industries, what businesses and so forth, are ones that are gonna uh, uh, require some attention uh, on your part along with the other members of the delegation. So I did that and um, uh, I, I was chosen to be on, I wanted to be on the Foreign Relations Committee. I thought my experience in Latin America would be helpful. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, secondly, I uh, enjoyed uh, the education labor issues. Uh, Again, and I'll get to back to that in a minute, why that, uh, that committee worked out beautifully. The third one, banking, wasn't one I would have necessarily chosen, but it was a perfect fit for Connecticut in many ways with the insurance industry. Substantial part of my constituency, particularly in Fairfield and Litchfield County, have strong ties to the financial markets in New York as well. And so not a bad idea to end up there. One of the first things I did is form a children's caucus in the Senate, uh, again, going to my uh, the, the, the getting on shortly after arriving at the Senate on the Labor Committee. I stayed on all three of those committees for 30 years in the Senate. I never left them. Um, and uh, uh, I made the mistake, that was a mistake, I teasingly say so. Uh, someone teasingly told me afterwards, not only should, should you connect the, uh, uh, do your research to determine uh, how likely is it you're gonna move up uh, the ladder on those committee seats, uh, and, and by checking how old are your colleagues, particularly on your side of the aisle, or, or how, how perilous are their pull up politics in their state. Um, I, I sat next to for 30 years, Ted Kennedy, Paul Sarbanes, and Joe Biden uh, on all three of those committees. And, and it wasn't until 28 years after I served in the Senate that I got to chair a full committee. Ted Kennedy unfortunately got sick and passed away. Joe Biden became vice president and Paul Sarbanes retired. Um, but I enjoyed the committee assignments. And I mentioned the Children's Caucus because I also decided to look around what areas were not, there was not a lot of work being done. Uh, it may have been historically at different times, but not the time that I was there. And, and there was obviously a great deal of interest still coming off on defense issues, on foreign policy issues, mostly Europe, mostly Asia. Um, 
uh, Labor Committee, but one out of four Americans are under the age of 18. Uh, they don't vote, they don't make campaign contributions, uh, and they had very little representation. So I started a, an ad hoc committee. I had no authority, I was in the minority, uh, with people like Pat Moynihan and Bob Dole, a uh, bipartisan uh, committee that came from committees that had specific jurisdiction over matters that would affect children. Um, in Latin America, I was at that point the only member, I think the only member of the Senate that spoke a second language. Uh, uh, there were no women in the Senate the day I arrived. Barbara Mikulski came a few years later, obviously very different today. Um, uh, but the idea of, of Latin America, uh, I quickly became sort of a, a go-to person on Latin America. Latin America has always been sort of a, an orphan in foreign policy. They get excited about it when there's a threat of of, of, of some revolution in the place going back. But on a day-to-day -day basis, Europe and Asia historically received much more attention for economic reasons than others. Uh, but Latin America is always an afterthought in many ways. But then obviously in the 1980s, the mission the issues of El Salvador and Nicaragua, Honduras uh, exploded, uh, became sort of a major foreign policy debate and discussion. And I found myself very quickly being involved on a major set of issues involving our foreign relations in this hemisphere. And then the banking stuff uh, uh, kept me busy, chaired the committees, the subcommittees on the securities industry and other matters, uh, became the chairman of that committee and not until 2007, when the Democrats won control of the Senate in 2006. And of course, I ended up right in the middle of the largest financial crisis since uh, the Great Depression. I could have chaired the Foreign Relations Committee. I could have chaired the Labor Committee. Uh, at that moment. Banking was not the most exciting committee. I mean, it, it, would you rather spend an hour maybe talking about derivatives or would you like to hear about uh, uh, the social injustice or something? Which one would attract more of an audience? Uh, but I really felt it was gonna be the, the, the biggest issue we have to grapple with um, economically. And so uh, as I mean, we may get to at some point here, uh, I, I authored an awful lot of legislation in the areas I just described to you on children's issues and on Latin America dealing with those problems. But, but uh, I guess because the bill by statute is called the Dodd-Frank bill, uh, and then that, that'll be a bill that people will pay a lot of attention to for years to come. But ironically, it was uh, a committee I paid attention to for the week. I was on the committee and obviously important questions, but the ones that had a more personal interest for me were the Labor Committee, the Children's Issues, and the Foreign, Pol the Foreign Relations Committee. And so when you looked at legislation or sponsored it, you know, would you uh, calculate the impact to your state uh, through any formal means? Or is it more of a, a general feeling about how it would have a long-term impact on the state? What kind of uh, analyses would you go through or would, would you like to have gone through uh, for any particular legislation that you either brought forth or someone else did? Well, you know, it's the old Edmund Burke test, you know, uh, I remember once I, I, I addressed so many public schools in Connecticut over my career. I spoke at every public high school in Connecticut at least once over those years. I stopped doing town hall meetings uh, when uh, I had one one night, a uh, Wednesday night, I'll never forget it. And I think about 10 people showed up uh, on Wednesday night at eight o'clock at some school auditorium. Uh, they weren't exactly go-to events for sure. And, and two guys got into a fist fight, one dressed by Abraham Lincoln, another a world federalist. And their picture was on the front page of the paper the next day. And I said, I think I'm through providing forums for people to show up. So I started doing schools, juniors and seniors in high school all across the state. And, and even, even in some cases at the request of a teacher, something a middle school here and there. But I remember being in a middle school, particularly since we raised this issue. And, and I was asked the question, how do you make it your mind? How are you going to vote, uh, Senator? Do you, do you follow your own conscience and your own judgments? Or do you listen to your constituencies? Or how do you do it? And I said, it was a great question. Uh, never forget her, a young lady and, and uh, bright red hair, I never forget. And she uh, and I said, well, it's a great question. Let me quote Edmund Burke. Edmund Burke was a scholar in England and he was asked that question one time and, and he answered it very well, I thought. And I sort of followed the Edmund Burke policy. He obviously was sent to be a representative of the people of a state. And even a small state like Connecticut, there's no easy task to try and discern where, where the majority of four and a half million uh, people might be on an issue. But you try to make sure you listen to people, you understand their point of view to the extent you can. And then you're responsible with your staff and others to read the material, do your homework, and come to a, what you believe to be the best answer. That was the Edmund Burke approach 
uh, to it. That's why you got sent there. That's your job. Pay attention to the home folks, but ultimately you have to make up your own mind. I thought a pretty good answer. Uh, she raised her hand again and I said, what, what, what would you like to say? She said, did you know that Edmund Burke lost his next election after he made that statement, which I did not know. So a, a middle schooler quickly told me Burke was a brilliant guy, but he apparently didn't do a damn good job, very good job selling his own constituency on his, on his theory. So you obviously pay attention to those things, but you are elected to the national legislature. Um, and, and we may get to this, Matt, but it's one of my major complaints about reforms in the institution. Uh, it, it wasn't long ago, it's not ancient history, that you were given one round trip ticket, a uh, train ticket, maybe more lately a plane ticket, when you, got a, when you were sworn into Congress and when your two year term was over to go back home again. Now, it was a practical matter not many years ago. That was obviously the only thing you could do because you weren't going to go home every weekend to Oregon. Uh, you could possibly get home to Connecticut, barely, but you could and get back. But then we changed that uh, not long ago. And you can go home at any time, at any point, for any public purpose. And public purpose is about as broadly defined as you can imagine. Uh, doing an interview with you uh, could fall into a public purpose. Having lunch with a teacher. <laughs> oh, God. So you have people now that just, you know, stay in Washington whatever few hours they can and get back to their states as quickly as they can. Yeah. Complete reversal of what I think the founders uh, intended, uh, and obviously under the practicalities of the day, but certainly we've paid a price for it. That de deviates from going back to the bills I was talking about. Well, well we'll get, I my we'll get back to the, the time allocation question because I think that's a very important one. Um, but in terms of the representational aspects you just brought up, I think you're a little bit different than some of the other uh, individuals I've talked to on the program, you know, who are, even if they're Burkeans, right? Uh, and, they're, and they're making judgments about what they think is in the best interest of their constituency, right? So that's the Burkean ideal. Uh, I, I'm also struck by your focus on younger generations since mm -hmm. they're in fact not voters at all. They, they don't even technically fall into the constituency for some people. Well, but I'll tell you what. Future generations, aside, right, which don't from vote. Having a good, aside from having a good conversation with them, uh, when you're dealing with, and I said juniors and seniors in high school, I didn't do the whole high school. Uh, in a lot of communities, that, that age of 17 to 18, they're juniors and seniors in high school. I found them to be a great, first of all, it was great politics uh, because they, they're still reflecting th what happens at the kitchen table in the morning before they go to school. Whatever the mom and dad are complaining about, more than likely it's a local issue, but nonetheless, based on what's occurring, they have their views. And, and so it's a pretty good uh, reflection of how that community may feel uh, about matters generally, because they'll ask all the questions. Remember, they know I'm coming. I don't just show up. Uh, so I, uh, there's several days before I get there. The guy's coming. What are the questions we're going to ask him? Uh, what committees is he on? What and so forth? I'm there for that hour, an hour and a half, whatever it is in the school. And then after I leave, what did he say? Uh, what did you agree with? What did you disagree with? So it leaves a much broader imprint in the community than you might otherwise imagine. And, and lastly, they're only a year or months or weeks away from maybe registering to vote. Uh, and so they're starting to get their own views on things, not just their parents' views. So you're getting not just a, a quick snapshot of where things may be in that town, but also where they're likely to be going. Uh, is there some great deviation on how they think about gun control or the legalization of marijuana than their parents might? So I found it to be enjoyable. First of all, a lot of fun, because uh, kids are great and they say an honest things and they question, in a very direct way. And, uh, and I found it far better than that 10 people who showed up and got into a fist fight uh, when one was dressed as Abraham Lincoln and the other as a world federalist, whatever that is. Uh, so I, representation you know, for you is not just about the current voting uh, population, yeah, no, no. it's also thinking ahead towards the future generation. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, let's go back to the time question since you brought that up. Um, you know, there's obviously there's the back and forth. There's proposals, you know, at the two weeks on, one week off or three weeks on, one week off. Where, where do you fall in how Congress should allocate its time between, you know, the D.C. and the and the local uh, on the in the constituency and then also between legislation and oversight activities? Well, again, I, I'm, I'm a great believer that the, the issues are so difficult and complex uh, today. Uh, and they're not obviously 
just local issues. Uh, whether we like it or not, we're, we're, we are the indispensable country in many, many ways, at least we are up to now. Um, and so this is not a job. I mean, I respect the fact that people like to get home for the politics, but that's not what the national legislature, yeah, that's, that's not, not what you were elected to do. Um, now you can do a good job, listen to your constituency, answer things today with technology. What is that old expression that, that, uh, that necessity is the mother of convention? And uh, I doubt you and I would be doing this interview this way had there not been a pandemic. I suspect you would have come down here or I would have met you someplace and you would have had a camera crew and the like. We're doing this te technology is here to stay. It might've been 20 years before we might've gotten to this or maybe 10 less, but nonetheless, it wouldn't have happened naturally, but for the pandemic in this space and the time it did. And I think that's changing. So this idea I have to get home every day to meet people and see people uh, is baloney. It's basically allowing, it's subsidizing. The American taxpayer is subsidizing your political campaigns uh, to get back. And, you know, you're, you're picking and choosing where to go. Uh, you're not making yourself necessarily available to the people who'd like to talk to you because they disagree with you at all. So you're picking your own audiences along the way. And again, I, you know, certainly I went home and I campaigned and did those things. Um, but ever since 1994, I mean, I, I, Newt Gingrich uh, made it very clear. He, he changed the whole game uh, when he said for the first time, and the, there was an arrogance among the Democrats after 40 years. And so the change was going to come and it came under his leadership. And his message to his member was, get your backsides home as fast as you can. Come down here on Monday nights or Tuesdays and get out of here on Thursday nights or Friday. You still got about 70 or 80 members who live in their offices, uh, change in the gym in the morning, uh, and, and don't bring their families here. All of the things that combine to creating that, that collaborative environment, uh, they're essential in many ways in any institution, whether it's a public one like this or you're a school building or a corporation headquarters, people need to be together. Uh, they, they need to know a lot more about each other than, than uh, what party you belong to or what your view is on gun control. And when your kids go to the school together, when you're, you uh, practice your religion at the synagogue or church of your choice, or whatever else it may be, you're all of a sudden discovering because you spend time with them. You, you know, you hate the Yankees and love the Red Sox. So, you, you know, you, you like to play tennis or golf, or whatever else it is. All of that unspoken stuff contributed very significantly to that environment uh, that creates at least the opportunity for compromise. Uh, and, uh, and so I think it's been uh, a great tragedy in many ways that uh, we've allowed it to become that. And I think it's one of the reasons why the nation has become so polarized. I mean, we blame it um, on our constituents, but we have an awful lot to do with basically fanning those flames, in my view, uh, resulting in what we see today. So what would be your ideal time allocation then? Is it well, sounds like full time in D.C. then? Well, make your choices. I mean, I, you know, you, 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 you know, this idea of a you know, month on, month off, what the hell is that all about? Where, who else gets a job like that? <laughs> you know, uh, wouldn't I love to practice law a month on, month off? And I don't mean virtually a month and a month in the office. I mean, go do what you want to do for a month, you know, raise your money, go knock on doors in the neighborhood you'd like to, you know, all that stuff. And by the way, when you get through with that, come on down here for a month and we'll maybe talk about people's taxes or the educational system or the environment or anything else. It's ridiculous, in my view. All right, well, let's move on to the next question, which is around um, uh, the Senate and, and rules in the Senate. So one, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's a dream is held by, by some uh, that if you get a better set of rules in the Senate, you get a better Senate or, or you get a better set of rules in, in the Congress and you get a more capable, more, uh, you know, more responsible Congress uh, that can that can work, um, you know, better for the American people. So in the Senate, and maybe we'll start with committees because you ran, you know, the, you know, very important committees, you, you participate in important committees, long periods of time. Are there, and obviously the Senate's different than the House in terms of the way that it runs its committees and its, and its business, but when you think about committees where a lot of the work is supposed to be done, um, can you talk about what you think a good set, of, what learnings did you have about what rules work in committees, how committees should be run to maximize their capabilities, their capacities? Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's uh, again, <laughs> may depend upon what 
what, where you are in your career. Uh, if you're a new member in the Senate, you probably want the rotations to occur a lot more frequently so you have a chance to move up the, the food chain here and, uh, and, and acquire the necessary clout to have more of an impact on the committee products. The, the more senior you get, the less inclined you are to make those changes because you are moving up the food chain. So it's, I, I always sort of liked, the, the Republicans did it. Uh, um, and again, I liked the committees I was on, but and, uh, and I think there's a value in staying on a committee long enough to actually develop not so much the longevity, but the expertise to be familiar with the issues and so forth. And a lot of them are particular, particularly the banking committee issues. We talk about financial literacy of the general population. I say this respectfully, but the financial literacy of members of Congress would also help uh, on this matter. And you don't get to understand, when I was dealing with the bill and, and that huge bill on, uh, on the reform stuff we were talking about, it's a very complicated subject matters. Uh, to get people all of a sudden up to speed on talking about things, even dealing with credit cards and banks and so forth. I mean, uh, what might be a relatively simple matter because people deal with them all the time it was very difficult. Uh, so I, I find myself sort of going back and forth. But generally, I like the idea uh, of, of requiring certainly chairs uh, of, of committees that would allow them to be the ranking member or the chairman for a period of time. And then you have to rotate off. Now, you can stay on the committee but it changes leadership, but it's not a bad idea. Uh, I think the idea of having some diversity of participation, again, I don't think you're gonna see the careers last as long as they did uh, in the post-World War II period uh, coming forward. I think that's gonna, the, the practicalities of it, I think, and the, and the exhaustive nature of the, the job by insisting, providing for people to go home every week and saying they do, and, and, and that increases. And the, law, the, 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 the fatigue that you do. Um, the, the, the easier time is down here. You can manage your time. You don't have to do a damn thing at night unless you want to. Uh, uh, bring your family here. You're gonna spend a lot more time with your family in Washington than you are back in Connecticut or someplace. We're on Friday night and Saturday and Saturday night and Sunday. You're at parades and picnics and dinners. And then you're back on a plane again on Monday. How often have you seen your family? You know, uh, whereas if they're here with you, uh, that changes. So I, again, kind of going back, I think I think changes that require rotating out to some degree. I, I still like that idea. Uh, it, 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 and I'm, I'm not. I, I don't. Uh, it probably ought to be said to some degree of staff as well. Uh, I know that's where a tremendous amount of knowledge is accumulated. But along with the knowledge that gets accumulated, the power does as well. And, and one of the reasons I've always been resistant to term limits is because no one suggested term limits for staff. Uh, and if you want to lose the control of an institution and then require that people rotate out of it automatically, regardless of their talents and abilities uh, uh, to uh, add to the, to the betterment of the country, um, you leave that entirely to unelected people who have agendas that could be vastly different. Uh, than what an elected person would face. So I, 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 you know, term limits arrive every two years uh, and we're seeing a greater turnover occurring uh, with some regularity in the last seven or eight elections, been changed elections. And I don't see anything coming down the road that's gonna change that necessarily. And what about the rules as it relates to the members of a committee versus the chairman, you know, in terms of discharge? Yeah. Have you any thoughts about those kinds of balance? Yeah, I, I, you know, it's, let me tell you how I, I did. I, I wanted my committees to be active. I wanted my membership to be active. Uh, and I wanted them to, uh, so I managed my subcommittee chairs. They always, I, I always gave them staff. I, had, I, I retained veto power on it. Someone was a, just an idiot. You're going to be nothing but a problem. You know, I, I put my foot down, but I, I didn't, that was rare if ever <laughs> I think of it now. But nonetheless, I wanted them to feel as though they had, the ability to do some things as well. I'll give you an example of what I did in the financial reform package because it was a major bill. And I did this without telling even my own staff what I was about to do. Uh, I did it on an evening around seven o'clock after some later votes in the afternoon. And I used the Foreign Relations Committee committee room, which is in the Capitol itself. And I invited the membership, both Republicans and Democrats, to come to this meeting uh, and the staff. Uh, and uh, I held my breath and then I announced pairings. Um, 
between senators, a Democrat and a Republican. So I announced that Jack Reed of Rhode Island would pair up with Judd Gregg of New Hampshire and work on the derivative section. Chuck Schumer would be working with, uh, uh, I think, Mike Crapo on corporate governance. Uh, I had Mark Warner working with Bob Corker on Too Big to Fail. Uh, I worked with uh, Dick Shelby on consumer protection. And so I, I spread the work out. <laughs> and I waited for someone to say, who the hell are you to be announcing what you know, the Republican senator was going to work on? Uh, but no one did. Uh, and it was smart because I got, then everybody gets best. Not everyone solved every problem. But they came up with a lot of really great ideas, much of it which became part of the bill. <laughs> So even though they didn't vote for the bill uh, in the end, it wasn't me deciding what was going to be every dotted I and cross T uh, and one other person I might have negotiated with on that front. Everybody had a role to play and an important subject matters as far as the whole bill was concerned. Um, and that was always my approach in a sense that this is a committee is your asset. It's your ally. It's not your opponent. If you can get that kind of harmony working together to a large extent, you go to the floor of the Senate. It was a cakewalk. Uh, it's only when you went with a highly divided committee and everyone getting very partisan about their views or, or personal about their views made it difficult. So when we went to the, the two examples I, I describe it and having tried to do this, when I was, I was chairing two committees at the same time, chairing the banking committee and I was chairing because Ted Kennedy died and got sick earlier. So I became the, 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 the de facto or the, the named uh, unnamed chairman of the labor committee during all the Affordable Care Act debate, a good part of it anyway. And, and uh, the markup of the Affordable Care Bill in July of 19 of 2009 was the longest markup of any bill since 1868 in that committee. It went on for weeks and I into the nights and around the clock on occasions. And I just made everyone sit there and plow along. Uh, and I would take amendments over the weekend We'd work them out. I remember one Monday I came back and I announced that we had willing to accept about 75 Republican amendments. And I remember my Republican colleagues didn't want to vote. Um, how the hell were they going to make the case of voting against a bill if the chairman took 75 of our amendments on the thing? But we got the bill done. At the end of the bill, I'll never forget it. I have it here in the office. Uh, everyone wanted to be in a picture of the committee and the work we had done, every Democrat and every Republican. No one stormed out <laughs> on the thing. I listened to everybody, gave everybody a chance uh, on this critically important bill that was creating so much attention and news. I wasn't responsible for the finance committee part of the bill, arguably a more difficult part, but the labor committee part worked well, even though it was a partisan vote in the end. The banking bill, when I did the banking bill, uh, it was a year later. Um, and, and I'll never forget because we, we always have these little in-house contests, how many amendments will get filed before the, the markup starts. And so on a Friday before the markup the following week, all the amendments had to be filed by 5 p.m. And so everyone was asked, how many amendments do you think got filed? I predicted 401, and I won the I won the poll. It was exactly 401 amendments got filed. Over the weekend, I got a call from Dick Shelby. I was in New York City, and the call came in. I took Dick's call, we're good friends. He said, I want to tell you on Tuesday, we're not going to offer any amendments uh, at, all, at all. So we sat down on Tuesday morning. Uh, I told my side, look, if they're not going to be amendments, we, this is a bill we've largely put together because it's, it hasn't, we haven't been able to get a lot of comedy on this. Um, but I don't believe we should offer any amendments necessarily either at this point, if they're not going to have any offered on the other side. That committee on the largest financial reform package since the Great Depression took 19 minutes from beginning to end, the Dodd-Frank Bill of Senate, which became the bill uh, because it was that, that was the bill that was adopted in Congress. Two examples. And again, uh, I tried, I had Bob Corker. I went five deep among Republicans to get a co-sponsor of the bill. Uh, and it was, just, it was just so charged for people, the idea uh, of reform. And of course, the outside interest groups were vehement in opposition to it. I, I can't resist to tell you, Matt, that a few weeks ago, the Senate or the House Financial Services Committee had a hearing on, on, on where things stood after the, in the pandemic. And one member of Congress said to the first guy, the seven largest banks in the country, how did Dodd-Frank work during all of this? I think it was Wells Fargo. And he said, it's been fantastic. We never would have had the resources to make loans during the pandemic, went down the list. And she turned to the rest of it. She said, raise your hand if you agree with the guy from Wells Fargo. All seven hands went up. Well, I got to say, for a moment, forgive me, but I enjoyed that moment immensely, knowing 
how much grief I took from these banks. They thought I was, you know, going to ruin their lives somehow. And it actually turned out with capital, liquidity, uh, the FSOC, the, uh, the oversight, the, the heightened supervision, all of that stuff has worked very well. Uh, I don't mind saying so take advantage of the interview. So, so it sounds like the, your successes in the committees and what you think has worked in terms of rules when you were the chairman, when you controlled the rules, basically, yeah. the committee, was to make sure that uh, everyone's voice was heard more or less. Absolutely. Not necessarily agreed, but the voice was aired and that you made There's sure that the two sides there. worked together. Personalities do it different. Yeah, but I, and it, it may be different committees have a rationale for doing it differently. In the House, of course, the committees are huge. You know, and uh, and so you're dealing with an extraordinary number of people, and so trying to maintain order uh, requires probably a, a, a more frequent use of the gavel and, and much more discipline in the process. Senate committees are smaller, for obvious reasons, and uh, and your ability to give everyone sort of an opportunity uh, there is uh, is important. But you know, I, I'm Rosa Deloro, who's the new chairperson of the House Appropriations Committee arguably the second most powerful person in Congress. Uh, uh, she was my chief of staff for eight years, my campaign manager through two campaigns. And, uh, and Rose and I talk almost daily. And she's got, I don't know how many members of the House Appropriation, it's huge. Uh, but she's getting great marks from everyone because she's reaching out to everyone. Uh, her first calls were to Dick Shelby and her Republican uh, ranking member. Uh, she made sure that they were happy and things were going well for them. And how could she be supportive? It just, it's just, you know, it's human nature. This is, I don't know why people struggle with this stuff. You know, it, the institutions yeah, are different, but human, they, they're just still the same human beings when they show up. Most of them want to do good things. They have a different points of what is a good thing, but nonetheless, they come with that in mind, I believe, is my experience anyway. Most of them care deeply about the country, highly patriotic, uh, want America to succeed. Um, and a delightful, good people. I mean, I, uh, uh, yeah, we all read about the ones that go south on us for one reason or another, but my experience has been good people. We don't celebrate that enough. This is a tough job uh, to put yourself through this. And we ought to be celebrating people who want to stick their necks out and try it and do it to make a difference. And, uh, and so it bothers me when I hear other members talk about their colleagues in ways that uh, contribute to the public's attitude about the institution. What, 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 we're surprised that people think the place is a hellhole and can't get a day of the week straight, in a sense. It's because that's what they sell the people back home. And everyone does it. No one gets up and talks about what's working, always what's not working, you know.